First, I want to thank the department for highlighting me and allowing me to have this opportunity to present my research. It's very much in progress right now, but my plan is to work on this paper further and turn it into an article. So I'm eager to hear what you think and hopefully you can follow. Um, before I begin, I want to flag some of the content of the paper, which will touch on elements of murder, gore, corpse mutilation, war, slavery, eating human flesh, and other forms of violence. So this is a good moment to step out if you need to. Um, much of this grimness and darkness is also integral to understanding the work I'm going to discuss, and it will be central to my argument as well. So to speak on this heaviness of, of violence, of eating one another, um, it's useful to take this as a, a nice point of departure. So this paper will focus on the obscure, grim work, the Alexandra, and how its author, Lycophron, plays with light and darkness, comprehension and obscurity, and of all places, the belly. So I use the term obscure specifically to refer to the Alexandra for a few reasons. Namely, the fact that Lycophron is scarcely read by modern audiences. Very little is known about the work's genre, really, or the author. The dating's a little uncertain as well. The subject matter of the Alexandra inspires confusion, either due to heavily obscured mythological references, unclear uh, vocabulary, strange compounds. It's impossible to read the Alexandra unless you use a commentary. Fortunately, there are some recent ones. So, this assessment of this work being challenging, being obscure, being difficult, being grim and depressing and violent isn't necessarily a modern assessment alone, but also an ancient one. So in the Suda, there's reference to the Alexandra being a skotenon poema, a dark poem, with dark implying both violent, but also confusing. Since this work winds and dwells in the obscure, forgive me a bit for this long prelude. Um, I'll provide some of the background here that we have about Lycophron, a little bit of background about what the Alexandra is about, and then we can get into how Lycophron toys with the language of light and darkness, and what I'll argue will be glory and obscurity. So despite so much uncertainty surrounding this work, there are a few things that we definitely know. Um, we know that the Alexandra is sometimes called the Cassandra, named after one of its title characters. It's about 1,400 lines, I think it's about 1,474 lines, written in iambic trimeters, so very much a tragic attic uh, meter, and it's dated to the Hellenistic period. So following the death of Alexander the Great, somewhere in between there and the Battle of Actium. More precise thing is a little tricky since we don't know much about Lycophron. We think that this is probably a pseudonym. Um, recent scholarship, namely the works of Simon Hornblower, his commentary in 2018, and McNellis and Sens in their 2016 work on Lycophron's style, they try to date the Alexandra to sometime after the Second Macedonian War, based off of some internal references and a heavy focus on settlements throughout Magna So the current scholarly opinion is the works likely written sometime around 190 BCE, um, but we also don't know where Lycophron's from. Is he from Alexandria? Perhaps. Is he perhaps um, working in Asia Minor? There's a scholar or two that argue that. Um, but with this later dating, we can at least be sure that this is not the same Lycophron writing in the third century at the same time as Callimachus and writing tragedies, despite sharing tragic music. Right. So the Alexander is famous for being heavily elusive, having obscure mythological references, and an unrelenting grimness. Characters aren't simply eaten, but they're ground down to gristle. It's really cool. Um, the title of the work refers to Cassandra, um, a princess of Troy who's blessed with the gift of prophecy, but cursed 
with not being the lead since she shunned the advances of Apollo. The narrative structure, as I've been hinting towards, is strange. It's modeled after a tragic messenger speech um, with a Trojan guard reporting prophecies verbatim from Alexandra or Cassandra. And he's reporting this to King Priam. Was this performed? We don't know. There's some opinion that it's too hard to follow for anyone to get much from it hearing it. Um, there's no other character other than this guard repeating prophecies, so perhaps not staged. Um, but the guard's reporting what Cassandra's saying because she's been locked inside of an enclosed space, a sort of prison, and she's uttering these prophecies to herself on, this, on the very day that Paris is setting out to go to Sparta, hence to abduct Helen. What follows is a sweeping toward the chorus of unusual compound words, borrowings from Homer, strange hapax legomena, allusions to Aeschylus, Aphonician, epic, Hellenistic geography, and localized cults through the most opaque references. And we'll see a few of them where you have a list of epithets. I think about six of them back to back to refer to Demeter. Very, very dense. Um, Cassandra's main narrative of her prophecies follows events before the Trojan War, such as the sack of Troy by Hercules, which I'll focus on a bit. The events of the Trojan War, there's an exciting scene speaking of a, a firebrand busting out of the womb of the Trojan horse to raise all of Troy, um, and quite a few of the other returns homes. So, Agamemnon returning home with Cassandra, the wanderings of Odysseus and a mini Odyssey, um, and a heavy emphasis on how much she'll suffer and everyone else for a number of reasons. So this emphasis on destruction, death, um, and violence factors into some of this darkness of the poem. And I keep harping on this darkness, not only for this reputation here, but even in the introduction of the work, there's language speaking of how it's riddling, confusing, and grim. And I'll add one more thing on, on this darkness. It's both literal and figurative. So Harris is initially described as a firebrand that will bring destruction to Troy. And other famous or illustrious heroes who are Greek are not named, but their names kind of sink into darkness and shadow. Play with that a bit. So recent scholarship on Lycophron is focused on how Baroque it is and how expansive it is, especially in contrast with a sort of Polemichian aesthetic of being simple, short, and clear. The contours of this argument follow some recent work done by Avina Sistapu on the aesthetics of what she calls Hellenistic darkness. She draws some of this idea of Hellenistic darkness from Romantic era discussions of excess and violence, an oppressive atmosphere, um, grimness, ghosts, etc. And recent work has allowed a more careful consideration of these themes in this darkness as emotional, as tragic excess, um, Aeschylus plus almost. And there's also a self conscious exploration of these poetics in format and in subject matter. So that's the background. We, we'll, we'll wind through here and there. So I'm suggesting in this paper that these rhetorical approaches to darkness and excess are most explicit in the beginning of the work as a sort of um, programmatic opening. And distinct episodes that we'll look at will focus on eating human beings and kind of toying with light and darkness, reputation and obscurity. So there are only a few episodes where this happens, but they're significant. I'll focus on specifically Pelops, the grandfather of Agamemnon, Cassandra's captor, um, whose ingestion by Demeter is brought into very grim detail here. Um, Hercules, one of the first people to attack Troy and sack it. Um, and both of them being envisioned as being eaten up. Hercules is ingested, still alive even, which is very strange. Um, and both 
book narratives, their names are not mentioned outright. There is a mention of a Hercules, but it's not our Greek hero Hercules, it's someone else. Um, and there's a heavy emphasis on the cutting up of the body, chewing it up, reducing it to gristle and burying it, and most of that in a few passages. Some of these striking terms, terms of phrase that we'll see highlight either an absence of light, which I think is very significant, or in the case of Pelops, there's a, a conscious omission of another, um, of some terms referring to shining, referring to light, um, that Lycophron omits from previous references. So this would be a little, a little elusive, and hopefully you can follow. <laughs> um, so, Let's start. <laughs> so we're going to start with the Pelops episode first and some of the vocabulary or well, we'll look at some of the vocabulary of shining and of light. And then hopefully you'll be able to trace it throughout the opening, the episode of Pelops and the Hercules episode. So where the language of light, of light and darkness are most clearly expressed, the narrator differentiates between Greek and Roman so the sacrifice of Troy and the descendants of Troy, um, also illustrious and obscure. So the illustrious individual who is often receiving a form of glory or playoffs, um, a positive reputation is destroyed, eaten, or their glory and illustriousness is diminished if they're not Trojan. And near the very end, I'll show an example of characters who are Trojan and their playoffs, their glory is highlighted. We only have the word playoffs, I think, about five times throughout. Um, so it's very, very striking. And the Pelops episode in Pindar will be a nice point um, of contact for this. I'm, I'm arguing that this use of playoffs is a clear signpost for, um, for understanding, for, for being able to make your way through some of these um, obscure references. Sometimes this play on light and darkness is signified through language of lamps, of fire, of shining, and in other instances, kudos, hinting towards some other texts. When it comes to darkness, the key term will tend to be the language of shadow or smotos. And here's a, a few other terms that I'll be looking at. Playos, um, kudos. Skaltos and Kalinos, um, a word which can either mean dark or grim. This idea of Skaltos will be crucial to reading the poem, um, and it's so important that it's kind of signaled early on, that and Kalinos, in the first seven lines. So in the prologue of this work, our guard, our narrator, approaches Priam, and he states that he will report what was said by Cassandra in the ways that she has done so. And this signals a, a number of kind of winding references. And I'll bear with me. I have some Greek for you to read the, the translation here. I will say everything unerring, which things you ask me from the very beginning. Should the speech run long, pardon me, master, for the maiden was not calm when prophesizing as before. She let loose the varied song. But instead, and hinting now, pouring out an inexpressible and mingled shout, she prophesies a voice from her laurel-eating gullet, mimicking the speech of the cruel sphinx. Very unclear language, um, kind of contributing to some of the obscurity of Lycophron. But these opening lines showcase an outsized emphasis on language um, and, and speaking clearly, I would say. There's even a subtle pun here with Lexo, I will speak, I will say, and Alexandra, the speaker. I also want to highlight that this speaking is not mingled up. It's meant to be clear. It's meant to be unerring with this netre force, unlike the speech we'll get for another 1,400 lines. Cassandra's manner of speaking, at least before 
um, the accounts will receive. It, it's described as a loosening of varied speech. It's an I alone star. And now we have something that's more mingled together, Hamunge. References, epithets, um, different resources or um, allusions are combined in unusual ways. And these elements mark the speech which will follow as vast, unclear, confounded, riddling like the Sphinx, Kalinos, representing the Sphinx as both riddling but also dangerous, murderous. And these, I've used some of these terms here, especially that Kalinos, um, as a sort of prog programmatic term um, for referencing the difficulty, the, the challenge in understanding the illusions, literary references, and so on. There's also a subtle introduction of um, chewing and eating as well, with Cassandra biting into the laurel as a way of describing, uttering, flowing prophecies. So this distinction between intelligible and obscure in terms of light and darkness is reinforced later in the prologue, um, whereby the anonymous guard requests that King Priam follow a straight path through darkness, ushering in a, an early reference to an abstract darkness, um, an abstract shadow. And I also have this below, and I'll read it. Lord, would that you listen, recalling it with your clever mind, unfurling the difficult to explain paths of a riddles. Follow the traces, whereby the well-known path leads you along the straight road through the things in the dark. This language of amalthes, meaning like well-learned, well-known, is self-explanatory. But here I'm thinking of it in terms of that skotos. So the thing that's clear and intelligible opposed to the thing that's dark, obscure, and confusing. The ability to understand is connected with light, clarity, and illumination, and extends to a sort of mental clarity and understanding. This might also be a, a metapoetic device for looking out for some kind of knotted references to Pindar, or maybe Homer or Aeschylus. Speaking of Pindar, um, I'm gonna make a slight pivot now into Pindar's Olympian Ode to kind of showcase how, how this language of dark is, of darkness is highlighted and light is diminished through learned illusions. So for those who aren't aware, the myth of Pelops murders most fully treated in Pindar's first Olympian ode. Um, according to Pindar, Tantalus is a friend of the gods who abuses the hospitality of the gods by distributing ambrosia and nectar to mortal companions. Tantalus disregards proper laws of hospitality, stealing from divine hosts, but perhaps more famously, he participates in filicide. He kills his son, chops him up, serves them to the gods, and maybe takes a bite himself. Pindar describes this episode focusing on Pelops' youth, focusing on Poseidon's abduction of, of Pelops, and sort of glosses over the actual cutting up, chewing, sacrificing. There are a few passages from Pindar's account of Pelops being Eden, which are significant for the Alexandra. And this work is a praise of, of Hieron, a wealthy um, ruler in Syracuse uh, for whom this is written. He's proficient in racing, and that's generally understood as a connection with Pelops, another famed racer. Pindar uses this loose connection, the glory of Hieron, with the glory of Pelops as a, a soft pivot. And I'm hinging a lot of this on a word. Let me make sure I have it. Ah, I'll, I'll, I'll discuss the sacrifice first, and then I'll get to the meat of the matter. So this here at least describes Pelops being cut up with a butcher's knife, being boiled in a cauldron, and being eaten. Like the Franz account, 
of this same episode alludes to what's happening in Pindar. Um, however, the language of light and illustriousness is a bit more subtle in, in Lycophron than it is in Pindar. And Pelop's consumption by the meter by, um, and the gods is mentioned only in Lycophron in relation to Agamemnon, Pelop's grandson. This is the account that we have in Lycophron. It's a little more confusing, a little denser. Um, and he states, she shall see two thieving wolves, quick-sighted, soaring buzzard eagles, um, and the one shooting out of the root of Plinos and carrying waters, a half Cretan barbarian and a Bian, not a full blooded Greek from birth. One whose grandfather, Anaya, Herakiana, Arenus, Thurian, the sword bearer, that's Demeter, um, once cut into small pieces, fleshy with her jaws, and buried him in her throat, having devoured the shoulder bristle. Mm -hmm. twice, not the heavy, rapacious desire of the ship owner, on and so forth. A little bit heavier than what we had in, in Pindar, and Pindar even has this brief phrase of how he'll step apart from accepting this narrative. Like a leans all in. It's subtle, but in Like a account, there's more emphasis on the violence, on the cutting up, on the burying even of the shoulder and the throat. Lycophron reworks the more standard version of Pellets where even his shoulder, so here it's in Olenitain, Pondron. In Pindar, it's a shining shoulder. Um, and I'll read this passage. Glory shines for this man in the great settlement of the mighty Pellets in reference to Hieron, who was loved by the mighty earth holder Poseidon. When Clotho removed him from the pure cauldron, distinguished in regard to his shoulder, shining with ivory. Lycophron actively engages with the account in Pindar, reducing this illustrious shoulder of pellets instead to just shoulder bristle. Um, the fixation on the violence of the action reflects, I think, Sostaku's conception of a Hellenistic dark aesthetic. Um, it's grand, it's focusing on the, the darker details. Furthermore, the, the elements which marked Pellet's or his shoulder as significant, so this Baimon, Omon, that elephanti, um, it's instead buried in the uh, consumption by the meter. Even the glory of Hieron, this Kleos at Lampe that shines, I see and I'll go back once. I see Lycophron taking that same glory, which would shine and would be loosely connected to Pelops, and diminishing it here with hyperviolence, with um, this grimmer um, account. I also want to add a, a fun point. So in Lycophron's account, after eating that gristle, it's buried in the throat, which I think is significant because it doesn't get digested per se, which I think could be problematic for a goddess to do anyways. So in keeping with these grim, this grim theme of the work, Cassandra prophecy, her prophecies dwell on some of the earliest calamities of the of Troy. So, from Agamemnon's grandfather, the start of some, of, or maybe the end of some of her calamities, she pivots also to another character who's consumed whole, um, and this is Hercules. She doesn't quite focus on him sacking Troy as much as the events that lead up to it. In an earlier account, an earlier generation of Trojan princesses, um, Hesione was offered to be eaten by a sea beast, and Hercules is enlisted to save her. In some accounts, Hercules dresses up like this princess, and he's swallowed, but he defeats the sea beast from within. 
the Alexandra dwells on this macabre element still, focusing on how Glory's Hercules is boiled alive. His hair falls out. He seethes. And I want to look a bit at him being, being cooked up. Um, here's a base painting depicting him fighting the this, this seas. The passage reads, He whom once a jagged-toothed dog of trident lapped up with its jaws, and a living carver of livers seething with the steam of the cauldron at the flameless heart, he let his hairs of his head drop to the ground. Not very clear <laughs> um, phrasing, but that's like a frog for you. Um, here in like a frog, this belly of the sea beast that Hercules dove into almost functions like a cauldron. It's a leves. Um, and this obviously is a reference to him being digested. Demeter's earlier ingestion of pellets, however, doesn't have this digestion. It's not a levis. The shoulders are just buried. Looking at this ingestion here, however, we can see that pellets is spared the abuse of being cooked, unlike Hercules. His hair is falling out, he's seething, and perhaps most surprising, he is emphatically Empnus, he's still breathing, he's still alive. He's the one who's been consumed by this monster and he's cutting it up like a chef from within. Um, and I'm highlighting this Dithros Hecaton, this carver of the liver. And we'll see this again in reference to Perseus. So in the same way, that Agamemnon and Pelops are related, and Cassandra's expressing this um, grimmer destruction of Pelops. I see a similar connection with Hercules and Perseus, um, since they're related, distant relatives. And I, I'm focusing mostly on the language that's shared. So, in a later prophecy, while recounting among many, many wanderings, the wanderings of Menelaus. Um, Menelaus reaches Africa. Cassandra mentions it in passing and uses this as a launching pad for discussing Perseus and Medusa. I'll read this passage as well. Um, instead of a female, it's snatched in its jaws, and this is in reference to a sea beast. Um, it's snatched in its jaws, the eagle with the golden father, the liver destroying winged foot male, by the blade of the reaper, the hateful monster will be killed, its sinews slashed to pieces. And I draw again attention to this language of a liver cutter, connecting Perseus very closely to Hercules. Not only are they liver cutters swallowed by wild beasts, they're also trying to save a princess. In the case of Perseus, Andromeda, in the case of Hercules, we see all. These parallels between Perseus and Hercules, perhaps even Hercules and Agamemnon being descendants, um, book in Trojan calamities. I think it's meant to link this idea of Cassandra's initial sufferings with the overall destruction and sufferings of Troy. And a, a subtle thread I would argue is also this language of the kulos, which is extinguished in Lycophron's account of Pindar and with the close parallels between Hercules and Pellets being consumed. I believe that this, this similar sort of glory or illustriousness is meant to be blotted out. This diminished unshining glory, this lack of playoffs or kudos is suppressed through consuming these figures. Um, and I have a counterpoint to this where we have a, a very illustrious sort of playoffs. In the interest of time, I'll only provide one of these examples, two combined ones, but they'll be helpful. Playoffs is rare in Lack of Franz Alexandra, but where it does show up, either playoffs or kudos, it's in reference to Hecuba, Troy, Hector, or descendants of the Trojans, mostly Aeneas 
and his disciples. Hecuba has her own playoffs. Um, I'll, I'll read this passage. Cassandra is reported as saying, Mother, wretched mother, your fame too will not be unknown. The daughter of Perses, Brimo, the three form will make you her follower so that you will terrify mortals with your nightly howls. And it goes on to speak of her cult um, at the Sema. Sem I also have a, a reference to Cassandra praising the glory of Troy in which she says, nor my miserable fatherland will you hide your renown. Reference again to Hulos here, withered away in darkness. I, I highlight the vibrant vocabulary and contrast here as well. The language provides a clear term for glory. Not only is it glory, but it's apuston, which I view as a, a play on Puntano to understand, to learn, perhaps providing a, a parallel with Almacles, the thing that's well known, recognizable, intelligible. I also want to highlight how this glory of Troy won't be forgotten. It's Amiston, nor will it be Larenten, extinguished, um, representing a sort of shining or vibrant element of it. it. It's subtle and winding how this language of shining glory and names diminishing in darkness serve as a sort of metapoetic thread to guide the reader through some of these denser passages. But I think the belly, especially the processing of the Pellets episode, serves as a, a nice space for dying out of glory, of fame, of reputation, um, and having to really look closely at the sources, see what the references are in order to maybe um, get a sideways glance of it. Hercules, Perseus, they, they burn, um, but they don't shine, especially Hercules. This sharply contrasts this sort of perceived glory of the Trojans, who in death are two things, most significantly. Not Eden, which is important, and they're not inglorious. Um, I have other references which I didn't include here, in which um, Priam's name also is, is Murphy, and um, maybe hinted at um, through some puns. So while these names are obscured, a reader who can maybe navigate some of these texts, pick out the mythological or literary references, they might be able to become Alma Place themselves in an active sense and make out any of the glory of references in the shadow. It's not invisible, but it is murky. It's what to know. That is all I have. Thank you so much. For your Thank you, Chris. Questions? David. Is there um, any examples like in history where cannibalism was a real practice or in Greece? Some people think that there might have been cannibalism or at least human sacrifice on Crete, um, specifically at, I think, the Temple of Anemosphilia. But the archaeologists there are, are protective of showing the bones. Um, most of that evidence depends on a spear head near a skeleton. So I, I'm not convinced that there is real cannibalism. Um, and I don't think the archaeological records are, are clear enough in that way. I don't think we have clear like butcher marks on human bones or anything like that. I know that there are some studies um, going on right now at Mount Lucayon, but so far nothing has shown cannibalism. Oh, this is such a great talk, Chris. I, I was Thank just, um, I, your, the sort of connection between uh, Kleos and life mm -hmm. made me kind of think about how there's also a sort of tension between the two, given the sense that Kleos is only derived from this metaphor for hearing, right? Mm -hmm. Kleos is here. And you know, it seems like with the Pindar, you, you quoted very, you know, Pindar has deliberately conflated these two types of, of sensory experience. So, Kleos shines, 
but really Clio should be loud. And so I just wondering if, if, if LakerCon, if you if you think there's anything going on with that, if, if maybe there is a type of Clios that doesn't have to do with brightness. Because you're sort of saying at the end that there's a way to navigate this text and kind of pick out the subtleties and the resonances where you can kind of detect a Clios that maybe is, is still Scopino, so it's still kind of obscure. Yeah, I, I, don't, I wish I had the passage. There is um, there, there is a reference to preamp. Where Lacrophron discusses him being ransomed off, using the term Onethos. Um, there's a reference to his name being Murphy, it's an Amudron Onma. And in between these two terms, there's also a term for burning as well. Um, but in between these two terms, there's a reference to how the name was formerly forgotten, and it's Kundamudron, which I think is be punning on preamp, which I think you can only get hearing it. So there, I feel like there's a, an awareness of, I don't know, maybe hear, hearing the terms for light, maybe hearing the terms for darkness, and keeping an ear out to hear if you can recognize that, that name, even though it's terms for darkness, which is confusing. Um, Sisaku, talks a bit about how there's um, maybe this sort of hallucinatory um, effect in trying to connect sight with vision, though. That's, that's what I said on that. I'm not sure if that answers your question, though. <laughs> So that we have some, some testimonia about this work, which um, say that it's great for grammarians. It's a good school exercise, and some believe it was used for students to dig through, pick out myths, try to understand it. Um, it is weird that we have it, <laughs> quite frankly. Um, but it has had an outsized influence where um, we have references to it in, I think, Statius' Syllabi, so some Roman era works. I know that um, there's a manuscript of it that Milton consulted, and it's in Illinois. Um, and when, when it comes to the cutting up of the liver, I think it, it's a seed of anger. It's known for being kind of bitter due to the bile. Um, and I, I read it as Cassandra kind of sending out her own rage towards, um, Hercules, um, or perhaps even Perseus as well. Um, and I, I at least have in my mind the Iliadic reference to Hecuba wanting to bite into Achilles' liver and eat him raw. So maybe an inversion of that. Yeah, good. Um, I, I, I really like what, and also how we discussed yesterday on the metapoetics of this. Um, and just coming back to David, because he was saying all the cutting up, chewing and bearing, all of this is like uh, um, taking up all the genres that existed before and uh, cutting them up, chewing them and creating something new that is very dense and difficult and you can't see it. But if you pay attention, there is amidros, there is kind of a a shady path that you can find to read this text. So it's also a, a kind of a recital of um, expertise mm -hmm. and um, you know showcasing that he can take something at, which is very Hellenistic and showcase the expertise through um, munching and crafting something that is almost a continuation but a departure. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, what what we were saying is like who is Lycophron? And that's the the quite the discussion we had a couple of days ago is what does the name mean? And so I, I was thinking that it could be hinting not just to Lycos, which is from Apollo, uh, hence Cassandra and Alexandra, but this kind of um, the moment of a hazy light that you can't quite see clearly. 
and friend meaning mind. So it's kind of um, hazy mind, kind yeah. of. But you may have or other. Wolf minded. Yeah, wolf minded or wolf from light, mm -hmm. Lycos, Lycos, right? So, yeah. Um, so it seems that all of it is like a, a, a clever construct of showcasing the, the uh, expertise, right? Right. I gravitate a bit towards the the wolf meaning in terms mm -hmm. of just being a voracious consumer. Voracious, of yeah, yeah, yeah. The different resources and um, yeah. genres. Yeah. Great. Any more questions? This is another way of commemorating. You chew up and you re, you know, you, you create something new rather than yeah. Thank you, Chris. Thank you.